Good morning, Granite Hills. It's good to be with you this morning uh, via this live stream. This is going to be our best attempt to replicate Sunday School via this Facebook Live group. And we will try to have some interaction. Uh, I've got Javi Cortez here, and thankfully he is going to be helping to monitor your comments. And so just a little bit about that. You should see a spot on your uh, screen as you're coming in where you can post a comment. Uh, we would love to, to have your interactions, and I'll try to uh, see those and pull them up on mine as well. Uh, if you have a question, it will help to uh, put maybe like a capital Q or something that just lets us know that you're, you're asking a question, and, and that way uh, we will try to get to those. It, it, we will probably not get to the questions uh, until the end, but we will try uh, to get to those at that time. Uh, the other thing I would say is, is just by means of introduction, uh, I've got with me Kaylin Shaparo. Uh, Kaylin uh, is our college and career Sunday school teacher, and I've got also Mike Schmidt. Uh, Mike is the youth Sunday school teacher, and uh, we will be teaching out of the gospel project uh, that we have at the church from Lifeway. The, those of you who have your books, Please, if you'd like, follow along. Uh, this is the lesson that was done with the kids' time just before this. So we will be out of Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 38. Uh, the lesson is entitled, Jesus is Dedicated. And so I can see you all now coming online. Uh, like I said, we're going to try to make this interactive uh, hi, Joe and Carol Crawford. I'm glad you're watching. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to try to get into it. Now, Javi is posting up a question, and I'm going to read it, and then we'll come back to it, that we're going to do. And I'd like to hear your responses. And Javi's question that he posts up is this. Why does what we talk about most reveal what we treasure most? And we'll come back to that, but go ahead and begin answering that question in the comments, uh, and then we'll get to that. Here's what uh, I want you to know before we get into the scripture. Throughout history, there have been attempts to speculate on the life of young Jesus. As believers, we understand that God's word is not exhaustive in detail. That is, it doesn't tell us everything we might be curious about. However, we understand that God's Word is sufficient for telling us all we need to know for a life of faith and obedience. There may not be many details concerning the early life of Christ in the canonical gospel accounts, but Luke tells us everything we need to know concerning his first years on earth. Now, some of you know there are non-canonical books that claim to have stories about Jesus' life as a young child, such as the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Uh, but they are written much later than the other Gospels, and they were never recognized as Scripture by the early church because the Holy Spirit did not inspire them. And so even if they contained accurate information, which if you read them, is unlikely, uh, they would not have the same authority as Scripture. My wife and I talked about it this morning. Imagine somebody had meticulously recorded every single meal Jesus had eaten, you know, from, from uh, birth to, to grave. You know, these are all the meals he ate. Could it be accurate? Maybe, you know, but would it be as authoritative as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for our lives? No. And so what we have in Luke, albeit a brief account of Jesus' young life, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we can trust that this is what we need to know about Jesus' young life. Now, the specific words and subtle references provided by Luke paint a picture of Christ as the long-awaited light to the Gentiles and the hope of Israel. 
What God has revealed here in our passage today is more than sufficient to lead us to salvation. And it's also more than sufficient to give us what we need to share the gospel with others. So, in, in a nutshell, today we're going to uh, first learn about Jesus' name, what it means. We're going to see Jesus' uh, mom and adopted earthly father and, and the way that they are dealing with the first few days of Jesus' life. And then we're going to meet two amazing people, Simeon and Anna, and uh, both Kaylin and Mike are going to help me with that. Uh, we're going to note how they respond to this infant Jesus. And what we're going to see is that they cannot help but talk about Jesus. So at this point, what I'm hoping is that some of you have responded to this question. And if you haven't, go ahead and take time to post to Facebook, why does what we talk about most reveal what we treasure most? And as you're responding to that, uh, Kayla, I'm going to give you a, a chance to respond to that. Why does what we talk about most reveal what we treasure most? Um, it, it's human nature. It's, we like to talk about what we treasure most. I remember as an unbeliever, I was really into sports cars. And so that is what I talked about nonstop. And I think you can see that with friends, family, uh, coworkers that they talk about sports or their favorite restaurant or hobbies they like to do. And uh, you can tell that someone talks about most uh, what they treasure most. And uh, I can see that transition today in my own life, being a believer now, is that uh, I treasure God most, and that's uh, what I talk about most now. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Uh, Renee Lust uh, says this, uh, what we talk about most reveals what we treasure most because according to Matthew 12, 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, that's right, Renee. Thank you uh, for your comments. Uh, and Jess Schmidt says from Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's right, Jess. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Faith Hepner says this, it's what we're dwelling on. Uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, thank you, Faith. And, and uh, Mike, do you want to chime in on that? Why does what we talk about most reveal what we treasure most? Yeah, I think it's the overflow of our, our worship. Whatever we're treasuring most is what we worship, and we're going to communicate how great that is in our minds. And if we think that sports cars or something else, uh, that's what we're going to be worshiping. It's, it's, a, it's an issue of uh, our hearts and our object of worship. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Um, Bonnie Ray says, it reveals our treasures in our heart and mind. Mine is Jesus, our church, my children, my grandchildren, and my cat. Thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> uh, Kathy Godwood says, if we talk about Jesus the most, then we treasure him above all else. If we talk about silly stuff that are not relevant to our eternal life, we're wasting our time and unnecessary stuff. Uh, thank you, sister. Janet Helmer says, because we talk about what is most on our hearts and minds. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, sister. You know, as I thought about this, uh, I thought essentially this, this also goes to what we uh, post about or text about or, or, or make phone calls about since uh, many of us are, are a little secluded right now. But right, doesn't it just kind of reveal what we find interesting and worthy of conversation? Uh, for many of us, I think as this coronavirus puts us into quarantine or semi-quarantine or social distancing, which we're probably breaking at this table, you know, uh, I did wash my hands, guys, it's all good. You know, we have this opportunity, I think, to uh, read our Bibles, to talk about God. And, and, you know, even before we get into this lesson, I, I hope that you're going to call someone or, or those in your house, talk with them about this lesson and Mark's sermon today. This is a great opportunity to, to just slow down and say, hey, let's talk about what really matters. Pastor Mark challenged us to do this or that. Let's talk about that. Uh, what did you think about Anna and Simeon today? Let's talk about that. Uh, so, so even before we get into this, will you commit to talking with someone about this? We're, we're going to do our part. We've got some great help here. But... All of this technology is not going to replace Christians just person to person interacting about what matters most. So please uh, take the time to talk with someone about what we're doing as a church here today. 
Now, we're going to, in just a minute, get into our Bibles, again, starting in Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And so if you have your Bibles, please uh, get them out and turn there. As I said, the lesson is going to be about uh, the dedication of Jesus. But before we begin, uh, Mike, would you begin us with a word of prayer? I'd be happy to. Father, thank you that you have given us your word that reveals Jesus, our Savior, to us. Thank you that you have not left us in our sins, but you've given us a Savior who has lived the perfect life we could never live, who fulfilled the law, as we're going to see in this passage today, and who gave his life as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins and rose from the grave, showing, Father, that you accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you that he alone is our salvation. pray that you would help us to uh, display him forth now as we, uh, as we teach and as we look into your word together and uh, that he would be the object of our worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 21, I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. God's Word says, And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, this passage begins telling us something about Mary and Joseph Namely, that from faith, they obeyed God. Remember how Gabriel had appeared to both of them to give them a specific command? First, go back in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verse 31, and you'll see what Gabriel told Mary. He said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And, and the angel Gabriel had also appeared uh, to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And, and this is what the angel said there. He said, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And what this means for us is that uh, Mary and Joseph believed God's word through the angel Gabriel, and they did. They named their baby Jesus at his dedication. Uh, now, Jesus, when we say that name, that is a transliterated word, straight from the Greek. Uh, in the Greek, it might have sounded something like Jesus. I'll say that again, Jesus. And that word is transliterated from the Hebrew. And to the best of my knowledge, and, and Mike, you can tell me if I butcher this, that would sound something like Yeshua, Yeshua. And, and it's very similar to the Old Testament name, Yehoshua, or Joshua. The name Jesus simply means Yahweh saves, or salvation belongs to Yahweh. So what a perfect name, right, for the Son of God to be born as the Savior of the world. And, and think about this. Every time Mary and Joseph say, hey, Jesus, come here. Uh, uh, Jesus, we need you to do this. Uh, Jesus, listen up, right? They're reminded that they obeyed God. And every time young Jesus hears his name, he was reminded that he has a mission from God, and that is to save his people from their sins. So here is the glimpse we need into the young life of Jesus Christ. Every single time they called him for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, every time they did anything as a family, Jesus, Jesus, hey, Jesus, come here. Jesus, it's time to come in. Jesus, wash your hands. Every time Jesus is being reminded that the mission is Yahweh saves, and that's going to be fulfilled through him. What a precious thing we have revealed just in his name, and that Mary and Joseph obeyed and named this miraculous child Jesus. Now, 
This also brings up a very important attribute of God. Namely, God is faithful. This means that God keeps his word and always fulfills his promises. Uh, Paul teaches us that God fulfills all of his promises in Jesus. That's what he means in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where he says this, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Throughout the rest of this passage this morning, we're going to see that God is intentionally fulfilling his promises in Jesus. So let, let's look at just a few of those here. First, Mary and Joseph had Jesus dedicated the, to the Lord by bringing a pair of turtle doves. And that shows us that Jesus fulfills the law of Moses. Now we have to kind of go back in our minds all the way to Exodus 12 and 13. Uh, in Exodus chapter 12, God is going to uh, have the Israelites mark their doors with the blood of a lamb so that when he sends the death angel uh, on the Egyptians, the, the angel will pass over the homes of the Israelites and not kill their firstborn. And after this, he says, because I am bringing you out of Egypt by killing the firstborn of the Egyptians and sparing your firstborn, every firstborn child, man and beast, belongs to me. That's what God says. They are holy to the Lord. They belong to me. And so in order uh, for these children to, to live, they must be redeemed or they must be bought out, as it were. And so an offering was to be offered, and, and it was a reminder that God bought his people out of slavery and provided this lamb's blood so that the death angel would pass over the Israelites. And so one of the turtle doves was an offering to redeem Jesus, not because he had sinned, but just as an acknowledgement that the firstborn belonged to the Lord. Uh, how appropriate that Jesus, as God's son, is shown to belong to the Lord, fulfilling this image that the Israelites had been doing for thousands of years. I, the Bible's cool. Uh, all right, second, Mary and Joseph make the second turtle dove offering uh, as an offering of atonement based on Leviticus 12. You see, when Jesus was 40 days old, Mary and Joseph are going to go to the temple and, and they're going to offer this other bird as, a, as an offering. Now, what's interesting is most people offer it a lamb as that uh, redemption for the firstborn and a, a bird as the, the burnt offering or the cleansing a, after the mom had given birth. But there was this provision in the Old Testament law that allowed the poor to just give two birds, two, two pigeons, two turtle doves. And so this is how we know that in terms of Jesus' young life, he grew up in relative poverty because they didn't, Mary and Joseph, have enough money to afford a lamb. They brought simply two pigeons or two turtle doves because they were too poor. Now third, we see that Jesus, according to the sign God gave Abraham, was circumcised. And this goes back all the way to Genesis 17. You can see it in verse 10. That is, God had given Abraham this covenant promise. And uh, the promise essentially said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And I'm going to give you this sign. And that is, every one of your male offspring is to be circumcised. And so what Luke is doing in just a very few words, is showing us that Jesus fulfills the whole law of Moses. Jesus fulfills the covenant promises to Abraham. And Jesus is going to be the way through which salvation comes to the people of God. It's not as if Luke is skipping the important details. He's giving us absolutely what we need to know. And so, uh, I have this question here, and I'm going to pose it to Kalen. Uh, I want to hear from you, Kalen. What does it say about God's character that he kept his promise to Abraham 
after more than a thousand years. Yeah, <clears throat> this is one of numerous passages that highlight um, just the trustworthiness of God. Um, he's perfect. He's never failed to hold one of his promises. And often uh, God is described as being a rock. And I, I contemplated that this week. And it's not just a rock that you can hold in your hand, but if you think like a mountain, something that just is immovable. And um, it's something that you can trust your life to, that you can trust your soul to. Uh, I think that's why Jesus ascribes um, listening to his teachings uh, like someone building their house on a rock um, as opposed to sand. And it's just something that we can ultimately rely on. If you think of uh, having a relationship with a spouse, family member, friend, that, that trustworthiness is so foundational uh, with your relationship with them. And that's what we have with God. We have 100% uh, certainty that in his character and who he is. Absolutely, yeah. God is faithful. And even when it takes him a long time to fulfill what he's doing, right? Abraham, uh, presumably, right, based on this, is dead and yet has resurrected and is there with the Father. And he finally sees, oh, that's how you're fulfilling that promise to me, right? There's that promised child. Uh, so it took a long time, but God, his promises never failed. It wasn't like he went, oh, I forgot about that one. Um, he absolutely came through. Uh, so that's the start. Now next here, Kalen is going to teach us from Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. Kalen? Yeah, so um, have everybody, uh, 25 through 32, we're going to be reading in the ESV. Uh, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Some interesting things to note here. Uh, Simeon was righteous and devout, it says. Uh, this is a sort of hyperbolic language that was used in the culture at that time. And uh, it just really highlighted Simeon's character and his commitment to obeying the law, but not actually literally being righteous um, as we might think of it today. Um, Romans 3 says, no one is righteous, no, not one. And Matthew 19, uh, Jesus says, no one is good but God. Um, and then it goes on to say it was revealed by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before the Messiah. Um, and then it goes on to say, now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace. Uh, it's just so interesting how at peace he is and ready to die, ready to pass on, uh, because he knows who the Messiah is now. And I think I can reflect on my own life and see that in others, that when we understood who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah, that there's a sudden peace that comes over you and you're not afraid to die anymore. Uh, it reminds me of a story I had meningitis recently. Not many of you may know that. And uh, it was a really painful time in my life. And so Tema uh, threw me in the car and we were on our way to the ER. And on our way there, uh, the car got a flat tire uh, in the church park, right by church. Uh, so we pulled into the church parking lot and um, Pastor Mark and Mr. White came out and they were changing our tire. And they just looked like such bad circumstances. And I was in the worst pain of my life. And I thought it was so cool. Tema and I just looked at each other and we just started busting up laughing in the car because we knew that God was completely sovereign over this. And we just found such joy and security in his sovereignty and that we could fully trust him in what was happening. So it was a really beautiful moment uh, to know that God had us and everything was in his control. Um, and finally, it says here, Jesus will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. 
Uh, now, this concept is woven uh, throughout the entire Bible, from the Old Testament to the New. This, this wasn't a new concept. Um, so I'll read some scripture here that kind of ties it together. Uh, in Isaiah 49, 6, it states, speaking to the Messiah, I will make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And uh, you, you kind of think of maybe um, this night uh, in Louisiana or something, and somebody has this light out for the bugs, and um, they're like going towards it, or maybe a porch light, and you see all those moths in Nevada that come to it, and that's what we do. We, we kind of flock to that light, and that's what he was going to do. He was going to be that light that the Gentiles would be able to flock to. Uh, Psalm 86, 9, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you. Lord, they will bring glory to your name. And Malachi 1, 11 says, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. He's saying the entire earth in every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me. And uh, God's just that ultimate culmination that's going to come together and we're going to rally under him. Um, so throughout the Bible, uh, there's this promise of salvation that's not just going to come to the Jewish nation, but uh, to the entire world. God says in scripture that he wishes none to perish, but all to come to repentance. And uh, Jesus really ties this together in the book of John. So I'm going to have everybody at home, if you would turn to uh, John chapter 10, and we're going to read 14 through 16. It's uh, John chapter 10, 14 through 16. So it states here, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. And Jesus is talking here about this other fold, and this would be the Gentiles. Uh, he's speaking about uniting uh, the Jewish nation, his chosen people, with the Gentiles to create this beautiful picture of one flock underneath him with Jesus Christ as our great shepherd, our Lord and our God. And uh, that's the beautiful message of the gospel that we preach. Um, it's, it's just uh, such a, a marvelous picture and thing to let others know that they can come under uh, Jesus as their great shepherd and find comfort and find green pastures. Uh, so, Mike, um, speaking of becoming one of Jesus' sheep, how did the Holy Spirit open your eyes and kind of change your heart um, to where you would come and find Jesus? Yeah, it's a great question. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see the wonder of Jesus through the preaching of God's word, mm -hmm. as he often does and probably has for many of you. Uh, I had heard the gospel hundreds of times. I went to a Christian school. I was actually at a Christian camp um, the summer of uh, September 2007, right before a new school year. And uh, the gospel was preached maybe the 800th time, I don't know, 1,000th mm -hmm. time. And the Holy Spirit electrified mm -hmm. God's word at that moment. Amen. And I was born again. Uh, I was brought to what... Uh, Paul calls in 2 Corinthians, godly sorrow that leads to mm -hmm. repentance. And I remember that vividly, that for the first time, uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit alone, I was able to see my need for a Savior and, and turn from my sins. And since that moment, um, there was a marked change. There was a, a hunger for God's word that I never could have mustered up on my own. Yeah. And uh, that's led on a trajectory of following the Lord Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that this brings up a, a good point, because I think sometimes we see in this passage, right, that Simeon's just kind of at the temple complex, and suddenly he knew, hey, that's, that's the Messiah, right? And, and, and we could ask, how in the world did he know that? And, and the Bible essentially just says that the Holy Spirit had, had revealed this to him, right? Uh, and, and this is so similar, right? How do you know when the Holy Spirit's at work on you to call you to salvation, I mean, in some sense, it is kind of unique, but in other sense, it's always going to revolve around his word being proclaimed uh, and, and, and or us understanding it. And, and it's just, right, one day you could read it and kind of go, oh, that's interesting, maybe, kind of. And then at some point you just go, wow, 
Jesus is the one I need. I mean, that's kind of how it happened for you, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, there, there's power in the word. Um, and that's the beautiful thing. It's very similar to yours, too. There's, there's power in Jesus' words. Uh, it electrifies. You use that word, and boy, that's, that's spot on. Yeah, it, it is electrifying. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother. Uh, and, and I think next, uh, Mike's going to teach us from Luke 2, verses 33 to 38. Yes. So grab your Bibles again. We're going to read verses 33 to 38. Uh, I'm going to change it up. I'm reading from the CSB. Oh, man. I'll get on. I'll get on the <laughs> so, uh, verse 33, it says, speaking of Jesus, his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And Mike, I'm just sure you can speak up a little bit. Oh, sorry guys. So after recounting God's faithfulness, as Caleb was speaking about Simeon's song that he sang in praise to God, they recounted God's uh, promises that he had kept to Abraham and, and throughout all the, the promises he made to his people that uh, Jesus would be a light to the Gentiles, the gospel would spread even further than, than Israel. Simeon turned to Mary and Joseph uh, and informed them that Jesus would cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel. And he would also be a sign that's going to be opposed. But what does that mean? It means that through Simeon's word, Luke foreshadowed uh, themes that were going to follow through his gospel. Uh, the major theme especially is the, the upside-down kingdom of Jesus. That, that his way of life is going to completely turn the way of the world on its head. He also foretold that many people would reject Jesus as the Messiah. They're going to reject him as the one that God has sent to save his people. And he would extend grace and mercy to the poor and the weak, the yeah. oppressed. He would uh, cause these reversals that uh, the, the rich and the powerful, the people with means, were, were not going to be able to trust in those things. As we see throughout Scripture, God loves to use the weak to show his strength. That's and right. you see Jesus going and healing people, going and uh, preaching the news to the poor, and just turning the way of the world on its head. Um, as you're reading through the Gospel of Luke, uh, that, that's a really important thing to trace through there. And he's setting the stage here. In verse 36, Luke introduces uh, a second witness. Uh, in addition to Simeon, he introduces this uh, elderly woman named Anna. And she is a witness to God's exciting work he's beginning through Jesus. We know, as Pastor Jerry was saying, and, and Kaylin as well, that this isn't the beginning of the work of salvation. It's been going on since Genesis 3, really since God created the world and set his uh, glory being known throughout all the world uh, in motion and creation and then the fall. And this is going to be the, the culmination of his redemption through Jesus, his son. And Anna, is a, she's a beautiful example of single-minded devotion to the Lord. We see her praying and fasting day in and day out at the temple for decades. And she's a wonderful example of, of someone who is completely sold out to following the Lord. And like Simeon, Anna exclaimed the work of redemption that God was, was beginning through Jesus. And we can see a very important uh, aspect of, of worship in this passage. We can see it's instructive for the way that, that we worship as a church. Yeah. One important reality that, that we need to be aware of is that first, worship is first and foremost something that, that begins in our hearts and extends to all areas of our life. We see uh, that Anna is, is meditating on the, the glory of God, his, his wonderful faithfulness, and his love, and his mercy, and his compassion. And she's letting that extend out to uh, her words, using her, her voice to praise the Lord, instead of talking about, I don't know, the, the newest chariot, or whatever kind of great technology was coming out at that day. <laughs> she's praising the Lord instead, and she's meditating on the truths about him, and it's, it's, it's bringing people to worship along with her. So we see the worship is first and foremost something that begins in our heart 
And secondly, the aim and the focus of our worship should be God yeah. and giving him credit and glory that he deserves. So, Pastor Jerry, I'm going to pose a question to you. If the aim and focus of worship is God, which it is, how does this change the way that we worship corporately in song? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and you know, I, I have to do a little confession here. Uh, there are many Sundays where we, we all get together right and we're singing and believe it or not, I got like a bajillion things going through my mind. And so I, I just kind of get to singing like, oh yeah, I know that song. Or, or my foot's tapping or something. I think we can tap our feet in the Baptist church. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not really thinking about the words. And, and right, the Holy Spirit kind of checks me on that. Because uh, there's a difference between the music at church and the music, say, I'm listening to in my car. And, and it's not just supposed to be a beat, say, like, if I ever actually did jog to, to keep me in, in step as I'm jogging. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm not much of a jogger. But anyway, uh, I think what it says in terms of the songs we sing at church, for them to be more than just music, they have to be sung with, with a, a vision in mind of God as an audience of one. And here's what I mean about that. I don't mean uh, we come in and ignore everyone around us. But I want to kind of turn the image on its head because I think sometimes when I come in, right, I, I sit in the back. I'm a back row Baptist, right? And, and it has partially to do with we got four kids and we're a little cognizant of that, you know, not wanting to be distracted to everybody. But uh, I can say, okay, I'm coming in to be part of the audience. And, and you guys on stage, you're the ones who, who are leading the music. And, and to some degree, I'm, I'm glad of that, right, because you sing well and, and I don't want a mic in front of me. But I think the image, when we come to church, if it's going to be worship, is we are all the choir. And, and there's one person in the audience, and he's God. Right? right? And so all of us should direct our, our, our thoughts, our hearts to the Lord. And, and look around as if I've got a whole choir with me, helping me sing, thankfully balancing out my um, kind of... I'm like a baritone that can't pick where I'm going to sing, so, so I, I'm glad to have the other voices. But we're singing to this one guy, this, this one creator God. Uh, and, and I think the other thing that this says to me is, right, there's not this division between our hearts and our minds as we sing to God. Uh, so it, it, is, it happens. I will be singing and I'll go, you know, this isn't exactly my style. This, this, this music is not really my cup of tea. But that's not the point. The, the point is, hey, Jared, Start thinking about what the words are saying. Direct them to God. And, and what's so cool, even when the style's not my point, uh, my, my cup of tea, as it, as it were, I can look around and go, but it's somebody else's. And I see these brothers or sisters worshiping, and, and they're just singing their hearts out, and I can get back into the choir uh, with them singing to the Lord. Well, thank you for sharing those thoughts, Pastor Jared. I'm going to turn it back to you for our discussion time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're going to transition here uh, to some interaction, and Javi's going to put this question up again. Um, now, the, to facilitate this, we want to do two things. First, I want to hear some of your responses to these discussion questions, and then I also want to uh, hear some of your questions to us. It can be about anything from uh, worship styles to, uh, you know, how God reveals his will to us to uh, something about the passage today. And uh, be ready, guys. I'll pick on you. Ask a tough question because I'm going to funnel those to these guys uh, this morning. But if you would, if you're asking a question, would you kind of put like a capital Q to let us know, hey, this is a question you want answered versus something that you just want um, to comment? So here's our, our first discussion question. Uh, what should be our response when we can't fully understand all that God is doing? And, and you know, from the lesson, no doubt, Mary and Joseph, they hear from Simeon, they hear from Anna, and I, I'm just picturing Megan and I showing up thinking, okay, like we got to give these turtle doves because the law says it, and then we'll get our stamped, you know, uh, Jesus is dedicated, he, he's been redeemed, you're good to go. Like, I'm not exactly ready for these two old prophets, a prophet and a prophetess, saying the things they did. I mean, Simeon might have broken out in song in public, uh, singing these insane things about Jesus. So uh, th this prompts this question for us. 
What should our response be when we can't fully understand all that God is doing through the circumstances of our lives? And I've got some responses here. Uh, Megan Bennett starts this off and she says, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that's absolutely right, Megan. Thank you uh, for reminding us of, of that. Um, okay, let's see. We've got um, Bonnie Ray saying, our first response should be to pray. Absolutely, sister. That's so good. You don't know what God's up to? Uh, hey, Lord, help. That is totally legitimate prayer to ask. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's good. Let me just see if there's any... Excuse me, other responses here. Uh, Kathy Godwin says, ask our pastors for help. Uh, read and study God's word more deeply, and most of all, pray for understanding. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, sister. Uh, right on. Ann Mulkey says this, we need to trust him uh, and be doing the best for us. Or excuse me, I said that wrong. I'm sorry, Ann. Uh, we need to trust him to be doing the best for us. Yeah, yeah, he, he's still on his throne. And the things he's doing, they're going to turn out uh, for the best. Um, Jeannie O'Brien says, pray, listen, and wait on the Lord. Definitely, uh, definitely, absolutely. Another, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, Linda Gonzalez chimes in and says, praise him, repent when we walk in fear of the world. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely, sister. Scott Hepner chimes in and says, when it comes to our walk through shadows of uncertainty, the just shall live by faith. Amen, Scott. Thank you for chiming in on that. Um, you know, before we go to some other questions, uh, Kaylin, do you want to chime in on this first? What should be our response when we can't fully understand all that God is doing? Yeah, this, this really goes back to God's track record, and you can see that in his word. You can look, and thankfully, we can look back in retrospect and see all these stories of how God worked through people's lives, and you can see that sometimes things were answered instantly, and sometimes things took a really long time to pan out. So uh, we understand that, that things can take a really long time. We may never see them in our lifetime, but we know through scripture and through that track record that we can fully trust Trust God. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Mike, you want to chime in that? What, what should be our response? We cannot fully understand all that God is doing. Yeah, I think two truths about God are most vital at those times. One, that he's supremely good. Yes. And second, that he's supremely wise. He knows what he's doing, even though we can't see his hand or, or where it's going, where he's leading us. Uh, and it comes back to him being in control, being sovereign uh, over all things. Absolutely. Um, but as, as Caitlin was saying, um, I think of what God has told to uh, everyone who was in a precarious situation in Scripture. He said, I will be with you. God's presence is what's going to bring them through. It's going to bring us through, through his Holy Spirit. Yeah, amen. Well, and here's what I think about with this. Um, we, we're all kind of in a funky thing, right? Church, uh, Eliah asked me this morning, Dad, why can't I go to church? Um, well, baby girl, I think Camden was asking much the same thing. Daddy gets to go, but you don't. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, and baby girl, I hope you're watching right now. I love you. Uh, we're all in this weird thing, and I don't think we've hit the worst of this coronavirus yet in the United States. Uh, I kind of wish we had, but uh, I think it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. At least that's what my nurse wife is telling me. Uh, and, and, she, uh, and so, right, what do we do when... There, there's no sports. Uh, some of us can't even go to our jobs. Uh, you know, like, like, God, what are you doing with the whole world? Well, here's what I love about Mary and Joseph. Mary may be a teenager still at this point. What did they do? They just obeyed what they knew to do, right? They, they, they didn't know everything. It's going to say at the end of this Luke 2 that Mary's going to ponder all these things in her heart. It's not like she... Right away understood, oh, I got it. I can see the next 30 years because everything that's going to happen to my son. No, she knows the law says she's got to bring two turtle doves. So she does that. She knows he's got to be circumcised on the eighth day. So so does that. You know, the, the, the angel told him to name him Jesus. So they did that. Like, this is super encouraging for me as a believer. I don't have to know everything that God's up to. I, I can just say he knows what he's doing, and he's told me what I need to do. I can be faithful today. 
And, and so, you know, I think this passage gives us this wonderful model to follow. What do you do through the coronavirus? You do the next right thing that God has commanded in his word. The things that we already would be doing even if there wasn't a coronavirus. We, we read our Bibles. Uh, we pray. We love one another. We might have to be a little creative on how we do that. Um, we, we give. We proclaim the name of Jesus until he comes, right? It, it doesn't get more complicated because of a coronavirus. We just fall back on, hey, I don't know what all's going on, but Jesus has told me to do this in the Bible, so that's what I'm going to do. That's a little bit of my southernese, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm glad there ain't mosquitoes here. I liked your reference to it. To it. That was good. Uh, but All right, there's some good questions here. I want to get to some of these. Uh, let's see. Um, the, the first I've got here is a question, I think, from Becky Jordan. It, she says, how is it that the Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah based on Simeon's testimony? Uh, looking for the wrong kind of Messiah or stumbling over the Christ? Caitlin, I'll let you start on that. Why do you think a lot of Jews today don't accept Jesus as the Messiah, even with the, the clear testimony of Simeon? Oh, boy. Um, I, I guess there... It, this is ultimately, you know, speculation, but um, I guess uh, there's a difference between Jews who don't believe now and Jews, Jews who didn't believe back then. Ultimately, right now, I see that God just hasn't opened their eyes. I mean, I see the sovereignty of God that um, he chose when I was going to believe him and accept him, and um, I think that it's the work of the Holy Spirit, essentially. He has to open their eyes. Uh, they can't open their eyes on their own, yeah. um, and neither could I before I was saved, so... Uh, yeah. We're, we're, we're waiting on him. Yeah, but we're faith, we're uh, trust, trusting in him, and we're going to do, like you said, uh, what he says. We're going to spread the word of Jesus, plant those seeds, and he's going to ultimately make them grow. Right. And, and there are some things we can do in love for uh, helping people overcome maybe some obstacles that are keeping them in Christ. I think much of this is called uh, uh, apology or the study of apologetics. Um, being ready to, to give a good answer uh, when we, we have these opportunities. And so uh, there may be many hang-ups for a Jew. I, I, I think the best thing to do in this circumstance, right, is not just come up with kind of a um, canned response, well, here's what you tell every Jew who won't believe in Jesus, though you can do some research. I, I think the best is meet the person and find out, like, what is it that's keeping you from Jesus? Where Where's the hang-up for you? Do you just not believe he fulfills messianic prophecy. Maybe, you know, you could read the Gospel of Matthew together. Um, or, or is it something else? Maybe they've never even investigated the claims of Christ for himself, you know? Uh, so, so, yeah, good question, though, Becky. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, another one, this is from my wife. Hey, babe. Uh, she asks, uh, do you think Anna and Simeon knew each other's missions? And... How can we encourage each other to remain faithful in periods of waiting? Um, Mike, I'm going to let you take a stab at that. What do you think? Did, did Anna or Simeon, is there any chance they knew of each other? And how can we encourage each other to remain faithful in periods of waiting? You know, I've really never thought of that before. Thanks for asking that, Megan. Uh, of course, Scripture doesn't tell us clearly whether or not they knew each other or if may, maybe they met that day. But... Uh, I think there's a good chance that they came across one another in the temple if she was there constantly and he seemed to be a regular attender there. Um, and yeah, I think it does have implications for us as a community of believers, although it might look differently right now as we're under some quarantine. Um, talking about God's ways and his works together and sharing the ways that we're seeing him show his faithfulness in our own lives uh, can really encourage one another. I've, I've seen that again and again in this church. And I think that really helps me to stay on track and remember what my purpose is to glorify God. Um, looking around at, at several brothers and sisters right now who, who have been uh, that help to me. So yeah, that's definitely a, an implication of that. Amen. Amen. Well, and, and you know, uh, the church, in terms of some how, uh, right, how to encourage each other. We're trying to get more technologically advanced, and I want to do some thank yous right now. Thank you to Eric Metzger and John Mark Morton, who are on our soundboard. Thank you to Anna Oatman and Mike Oatman, who are making our Facebook Live thingamajugger work. Uh, thank you to Rick Malone, who's, who's on a camera right now. Thank you, brother. Uh, and, and to several, you know, uh, I, I have asked several for some input because... I don't know <laughs> how to do this technology, right? But you don't have to be a technological wizard to encourage someone right now. Even if you are uh, obeying the social distancing, uh, you know, a phone call could mean a lot. 
Uh, an old-fashioned handwritten letter uh, could mean a lot right now. Um, you know, dropping a, a meal off uh, just at the doorstep or, or something, you know, that these could all be ways of encouraging uh, one another through this time. I, I love that, you know, we're allowed to just kind of be creative. Hey, love one another? Go for it, right? I mean, kind of in the way that all of us were creative when we came up with really cool dates for our spouses. I'm hoping we're still doing that, you know? Uh, <laughs> but uh, we can be creative in the way that we show love to one another as the body of Christ, uh, for sure. Uh, Mike, I got another question for you here, and this is from Scott Hepner. So uh, he says this, when it comes to congregational worship, and if we are indeed singing to an audience of one, how can we be expressive, whether with hands raised or exuberance, without drawing attention to ourselves rather than God, who alone is worthy? Yeah, I think in Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, he talks about orderliness and worship. And he also talks about um, not wanting to be distracting in, in any way, whether it's food offered to sacrifices or any kind of worship uh, to the weaker brother. Um, so I think that's, first of all, the, that's probably the first um, line of thinking that we should find ourselves in uh, not wanting to do anything that would be distracting to another person. But at the same time, throughout Scripture, you also see, uh, and, and in the Psalms, even choir directions, lifting your hands and, and shouting and spinning around. Uh, there are a lot of different expressive ways uh, that people throughout redemptive history have, have expressed worship. Amen. So uh, I'm... Let's think about that together. I think that's going to take uh, knowing our context, knowing the people uh, with whom we worship, and uh, that's not just a cut and dry answer. So thank you for thank you for bringing that topic up. Amen. Yeah, uh, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, via this live stream. We hope to do this every week. Uh, just a few things, and then we will wrap up and transition to our service. Uh, first is. If you would like a physical book, we will do our best to get one to you. Just let uh, me know. Uh, you can send a, an email or, or make a uh, comment on the church, uh, excuse me, the church website. It's probably the best. Uh, so ghbcreno.org, there is a contact us link there. If you want a physical book, we do still have some of those. Uh, second, you know, if you really got this pressing question or you want to follow up, uh, Continue to post them or reach out to us that way, and we'll do our best for sure to get to them. Sometimes there's questions that we just, for the sake of time, can't really give it you know, the answer it deserves. But thank you for, for chiming in here uh, on these. Uh, and then third, I'm going to leave you with a few questions that I would love for you to talk about with uh, people there at your house or with somebody you can get on the phone with. So, And I'll, I'll have uh, Javi post these up as well in, in uh, Facebook afterwards. But first is, if speaking the truth into the lives of others indicates our love for God, what does this say about our own lives? What needs to change? Second, why should we be comforted that salvation comes from and belongs to the Lord when we're seeking to tell others about Jesus? Third, who is someone God wants you to talk to this next week about him? Today, uh, we're hoping that this brief look at kind of the infancy of Jesus from the canonical gospel of Luke uh, provokes you to faith in the faithful God. And that we also hope this provokes us to show our faith by simple obedience, even when we don't understand everything God is doing. Uh, Lord bless you. Caleb, would you close us please now in prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to come here uh, and broadcast this, Lord. It's by your hand alone you give people the creativity to uh, be able to create technology like this where we can spread your word through this medium, Lord. Uh, we're just so thankful for that. We're thankful uh, ultimately for your son coming and dying for our sins, Lord, that we could be saved and, uh, and be with you forever, Lord. So may our lives in every way reflect uh, our love and our worship to you and to you alone. Yes. We love you, and uh, please just strengthen our church through this tough time right now as we're distanced from one another. Uh, may we uh, find ways to love one another yes. and um, really strengthen one another uh, in a time where we really, really need it, Lord. So please infuse us with your Holy Spirit. Give us, a, give us wisdom and guidance. And uh, I pray all this in your Son's mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.
Bye.